Hello and welcome back to your computer hardware uh, class and I'm sure that you scored very well in your last assessment and we are now going to be discussing the motherboard components that are used for communication among devices. Now if we look carefully at our motherboard we're going to see a lot of fine lines on both the top and the bottom of the board surface. These lines are some call, sometimes called traces and our circuits are passed that enable data instructions and power to move from the component on the motherboard to the component or vice versa. Now the system or pathway is used for communication and the protocol and the methods used for transmission are collectively called a bus. Now think about that. How many of you got to and from school today may have been on the bus. Well, if you think of yourselves as data going from the component of home to the component of school, you will find that you are traveling on the bus to get to and from your destination. Now, the protocol that we would mentioned there is nothing more than a fancy word for saying a set of rules. And we have to have a set of rules in order to get you to and from your component home to the component school. And we also have a set of rules in order for us to get from point A on our motherboard to point B. Now the parts of the bus that we are most familiar with are the lines of the bus. And they are used for data. These lines are called the data bus. Now binary data is on a line of a bus by placing voltage on that line. Now we can visualize that bits are traveling down the bus in parallel. But in reality, the voltage placed on each line uh, that we place on each line is not traveling; rather, that is all over the line. Now, when one component on at one end of the line wants to write data to another component, the two components will then get in sync for the right operation. Now, when I say right operation, I don't mean correct; I mean right, as in to write something down. Now when the first component places voltage on several lines of the bus and the other component immediately reads the voltage on these buses, now please remember that everything that is happening here is happening at the speed of electricity. So the CPU or other devices will interpret the voltage or should say interpret the voltage or the lack of voltage on each line in the bus as binary digits, either zeros or ones. Now some buses have data packs that are 8, 16, 32, 64, or even 128 bits wide. Now the way I try to explain that to you is try to imagine a, a, a small bus which is a 16-bit data bus. Now that would be like a typical, a typical highway that is six, has 16 lanes, 8 going one way and 8 going the other and we can move a lot of data or a lot of traffic down that highway. But if we bumped it up to a 32, 64, or a 128 lane highway, just imagine the amount of data that we could move down that line at the speed of electricity. And if we look at the accompanying figure, okay, we, will, we will see that we have an, uh, an, eight, an 8 bus between the CPU and memory that is transmitting the letter A. Now, all bits of a byte are placed on their lines to the bus at the same time. Now remember, there are only two states inside of a computer. It's either on or it's off, which would be representing a 0 or a 1. Now, on a bus, these two states are no voltage for a 0 and voltage for a 1. So, the bus is either, as in figure, uh, as in the figure on, the, uh, on the screen, has either two lines and no voltage on the on the other six lines in order to pass letter A from the bus. Now, this bus is only 8 bits wide, but most buses today are much much wider and much faster. They're 16, 32, and all the way up to 256 bits wide. Now, also, a bus might have a ninth bit. Now, we would call that a parity bit for error checking. Adding a check bit for each byte allows the component reading the data to verify that, this, that it is the same data written to the bus. <coughs> Now, the width of a data bus is something we call the data path size. Now, a motherboard can have more than one bus, each using a different protocol, speed, data path size, and so on. 
The main bus on the motherboard that communicates with the CPU memory in the chipset goes by several names. It can be called the system bus, the front side bus, memory bus, host bus, local bus, or external bus. For our discussions, we'll use the term system bus or memory bus because they are the most common and the most descriptive. But know that the motherboard ads uh, that you would read typically use the term front side bus. The data portion of the most system buses on today's motherboards is, is 128 bits with or without additional lines for error checking. One of the most interesting lines or circuits on a bus is the system clock, also known as the system timer, which is dedicated to timing the activities of the chips on the motherboard. It's a quartz crystal on the motherboard, similar to that found in watches. It generates the oscillation that produces the continuous pulses of the system clock. Traces carry these, carry these pulses over the motherboard to chips and expansion slots to ensure that all activities are synchronized. Remember that everything in a computer is binary, and this includes the activities themselves. So instead of continuously working to perform commands or move data, the CPU bus and other devices work in a binary fa fashion. Do something, stop, do something, stop, and so forth. Each device works on a clock cycle or beat of the clock. Some devices, such as the CPU, do two or more operations on one beat of the clock, and others do one operation for each beat. Some devices might even do something on every other beat, but all work according to beats or cycles. You can think of this as similar to children jumping rope. The system clock, the child turning the rope, provides the beats or cycles, while the devices, the children that are jumping, work in a binary fashion. Jump, don't jump. In that analogy, some children jump two or more times for each rope pass. Now how fast does that clock beat? Well, the beats, called the clock speed, are measured in hertz, which is one cycle per second. Megahertz, which is a million cycles per second, and that gigahertz, which is one billion cycles per second. Common ratings for motherboard buses today are 2600 megahertz, 2000 megahertz, 1600 megahertz, 1333 megahertz, 1066 megahertz, 800 megahertz, 533 megahertz, or 400 megahertz. Although you might still see some motherboards rated around 200 or 133 megahertz or slower. In other words, data or instructions can be put on a 1600 megahertz system bus at the rate of 1600 million every second. A CPU operates from 166 megahertz to almost 4 gigahertz and higher today. The CPU can put data or instructions on its internal bus at a much higher rate than does the motherboard, although we often refer to the speed of the CPU in the motherboard bus. Talking about the frequency of these devices is more accurate, because the term speed implies a continuous flow, while the term frequency implies a digital or binary flow of on and off and on and off. Now the lines of the bus, including data instruction and power lines, often expand or extend to the expansion slots. The size and shape of the expansion slots expansion slot depend on the kind of bus it uses. Therefore, one way to determine the kind of bus you have is to examine the expansion slots on the motherboard itself. Now, as we can see in the accompanying figure, the first one, figure 131, shows an older motherboard with two types of expansion slots. Now if we look back at, at if we go all the way back to figure 19, we can see a newer motherboard that uses a newer type of expansion slot. The types of slots shown on both boards include the following. A PCI, a peripheral component interconnect or interface expansion slot used for an input-output devices. The PCI Express or the PCIe uh, slots that come in several lengths are used by high-speed input-output devices. And many of our motherboards also have a slot called an AGP for accelerated graphics port used for video cards. 
Now if we notice back in the original figure 1-9 and 131, the white PCI slots are used on both the older and the newer boards. A motherboard will have at least one slot intended for use by a video card. The older boards use an AGP slot for that purpose, and the newer boards use a longer PCIe X16. The PCIe currently comes from or comes in four different slot sizes, the longest size being the 16 and the shortest being the 1. With a little practice, you can identify expansion slots by their length, by the position of the brakes in the slots, and by the distance from the edge of the motherboard to the slot's position. In Chapter 5, we'll learn that each expansion slot communicates with the CPU by way of its own bus. There can be a PCI Express bus, an HEP bus, and a PCI bus, each running at different speeds and providing different features to accommodate the expansion cards that use the different slots. But all these buses connect to the main bus or the system bus, system bus which will then connect to the CPU. Next, we'd like to discuss the expansion cards. Now, expansion cards are mounted in the expansion slots in the motherboard. If we look at the, the accompanying figure, it will show the motherboard and expansion cards installed inside a computer case. By studying this figure carefully, we can see that the video card installed in the PCI Express 16 slot and a modem card and wireless network card installed in two PCI slots. The other three PCI slots are not used. Notice that the fan in the video card to keep is, is there to keep the video card cool because the video card has its own processing unit on it. We can see a full view of the video card in figure 134. These cards are all enabled, uh, or I should say these cards all enable the CPU to connect to, exter to an external device or in the case of the modem card or the network card to a phone line or network. The video card, also called a graphics card, provides one or more ports for a monitor. The network card provides a port for a network cable to connect the PC to the network. And the modem card ports for phone lines, whether be used for connecting to an outside network or possibly a fax machine. The technology to access these devices is embedded onto the card itself. And the card also has the technology to communicate with the slot that it is in, in the motherboard and the CPU. The easiest way to determine the function of a particular expansion card, short of seeing its name written on the card, which doesn't happen very often, is to look at the end of the card that, that it fits against on the back of the computer case. A network card, for example, has a port designed to fit a network cable. It's the one that looks like a giant phone plug. The modem card has one, or usually two, telephone jacks in its ports. You'll get lots of practice in this in this uh, in this book or in this course in identifying ports on expansion cards. However, if you examine the ports in the back of your own PC, remember that sometimes the motherboard provides ports of its own, and those are those are called integrated or embedded. That concludes this portion of the video clip. Please move on to your online assessment and then come on back and we'll discuss the electrical system.